This is the Agriculture and Working Lands Assistance Application webpage where you can access all of the information about the program. If you scroll down, there's all sorts of information about how to apply, how um, to register, what kinds of documentation you'll need. And if you continue to go down, there's more information about eligibility, a flow chart, um, if you are a visual learner to help you understand if your business is eligible or not. And then the information, as I was describing, about specifics around each of the eligible sectors. So you can see farmers, there's um, A through G um, for specific farm-related activities that are eligible here. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top. The very first thing that you need to do to apply is register. When you click on the register now button, you'll be brought to this screen. So there's a letter here that we would encourage you to read through and understand about eligibility and then some specific questions. Um, do you understand the above and agree? Then you just answer them. Um, and then if you are filing for your own company, you'll select my own company. And this is the first part where folks tend to get tripped up is they do not have a Vermont employer identification number. You are not required to have a Vermont EIN. Um, some people do and many people don't. Do not enter your federal employer identification number here or your social security number because that will not help you um, in the application. If you don't have a Vermont EIN, you need to select add company, which will bring this pop up. Again, it will ask you for a Vermont EIN number. If you don't have it, don't fill it out. It's not a required field. The required fields are indicated by red asterisks. Fill those out. Um, select add company, finish up the applicant user registration information, which is creating um, your username, um, which is your email address and your password, and then select register. When you have finished registering, you will leave this screen um, and then you can pause doing your application if you want. Once you register, you can always find your way back to how to log on to your application via our website. So then you'll go in to here to log in to continue your application and you'll come to this login screen. This is where your username and password are critical to remember. Just enter those in and click login. If you forget your password, here's your opportunity to reset it. So I'm going to switch off of this because this is the live um, actual what what applicants will fill out and move over to our test site. This is where we have been developing and testing the application. So I'm going to log in and you will see a number of general. It's mostly dairy applications, but they are all fake. Some of the dairy applications are with real business names. So just if you know any of those folks who run those businesses, don't be alarmed. Those are all fake test applications. So when you log in, um, let's see, looks like my password's not working. Here we go. So we'll log in here. And once you have created an application, it will appear here in your dashboard and you can check your status. So your application number, your business name, which application you're filling out. If you are in submitted status, incomplete, um, awarded or approved, the submitted date, and then you can always view your application. If you've started an application, you haven't finished it yet, you will see an icon that looks like this. It's a little pencil with the words edit. You will select the edit button to reopen an application that you have started and not yet finished. So I'm gonna start a new application. Agriculture and working lands is what we want. And here we go, it's gonna pull it up. Okay, so again, you'll see the Vermont EIN number. Some of this information may autofill based on your registration. If it does not, again, do not enter your federal or social security number click in here and then select I cannot find my company then you'll have to fill out um, the information here 
And this information is important um, to get correct. It should match what's on the files that you are submitting. And as you can see, mine doesn't have to be right because I'm in the test environment, but yours should be correct. If you have a Secretary of State ID, you can add that. If you know your NAICS code, you can add those, but they are not required. Now we get into the part of the application that it is absolutely essential that you get correct. So tax information principally from your W-9. What we recommend people is that they look at a tax return that they have completed and pull the information directly from there. So I'm going to um, put on my screen a fake, actually this is not a fake, this is my business from Montana's tax return. So when I look at my tax return, should be able to see that on the screen now. The Golden Yoke Creamery, 339 Mountain View Drive, St. Ignatius, Montana, 59865. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter that exactly as it appears here. And then the other thing is our EIN number here, 47-3919114. If you have an EIN and you don't use your social security number um, for your business, do not put your social security number in. So it's gonna be based on your business type, which fields you're asked to submit. So ours was the Golden Yoke Creamery LLC. If you have an LLC, please remember to put that in. We were a, a partnership. Actually, that's not true. We were an LLC operated as a partnership. If you're uncertain about any of these fields, it's best to ask your accountant because otherwise the application is going to come back to you. And as this is first come, first served, it's best to take your time and do it right the first time instead of having it sent back to you. Um, but of course, if it's sent back to you, that's not the end of the world. So here we go. We're filling it out. I was in Montana, select county. It's not going to let me pick a Montana county, so we'll just pretend here. Okay, and then federal ID number straight from that form, 47. It's going to um, tell me if my numbers are incorrect. And 919114. So you can see because I put the dash in, I can't fill it out. So take the dash away, put the last number in, and we're good to go. One thing to remember is that you don't have to fill it out all at one time. If you click back to dashboard, um, what we recommend doing is making sure that you go to your next screen before you go back to dashboard so that you don't lose any information. So if I wanted to stop at this point, I can go back to dashboard and then restart. If you want to add contact information, um, somebody else that's either assisting you with the application or that needs to be notified, you add them here. Easy to do. You just put them in. I'm not going to do that here. So then we get to general eligibility. These questions will be different depending on the kind of business that you are. Um, so I'm just going to click through real quick. I'm not going to go through, but you'll see if you answer a question that is an eligibility question, you'll get an error message and we'll be unable to proceed. Um, so here we go. We're just going to click right through. And I would recommend that everybody um, read through these questions and understand them before you answer them. Once you get through bill eligibility, you'll select your business type. I will be an agriculture business who is a farmer. Farmer question, do I have an annual gross income of $10,000 from the sale of egg products, livestock, livestock products, or poultry in one of the two or three of the five preceding calendar years? Yes. Okay, so now here's my income range. We'll do 50 to 99,000. And now I need to upload my complete 2019 federal and state tax return. So one line for federal, one line for state. So we'll just do, um, so I don't have a fake tax return to upload here. So we'll just upload some fake documents and get the notification that it happened successfully. 
pretty much any normal file type is accepted. So a Word doc, a PDF, Excel files, those are all acceptable. So my business was active. I'm currently open. Do I have a net profit? No, I've got one W2 employee. So you'll see here that there, if I say that I have a net profit and then I need a W2 employee, um, you can still be eligible. So this is where some folks are finding a challenge. If you're profitable and you don't have a W2 employee, you will not be able to proceed. We are anticipating potentially some legislative changes here, so stay tuned for that. So I'm just gonna say that I've got one so we can move forward. Uh, no to that question. And then these are just more eligibility questions here. Okay, here we go. And now this is the next section that trips people up is the revenue. So we need some sort of revenue table or documentation. So if you've experienced changes to your gross revenue, you can select no here and still move forward because you can be a profitable business. That means what essentially you'll be claiming is the economic harm se section. But we'll put yes here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show two sample documents for what would be acceptable for this portion. So we can either do let me pull it up here. So this is a very simple profit and loss table. This template is available on our website for folks who do not use QuickBooks. So you just fill it out, income, expense, full year 2019, 2020, um, full year to date um, by month. And you're just doing income over expense. We're not looking for net income we're not looking um, for cost of goods sold this is the basic information that you will need if you don't have that uh, because you use quickbooks you might have a report that looks something like this so on this particular one we would look for the line item of sales so gross sales is what we want we don't we are not concerned with gross profit. We're not concerned about your expenses, purely just your sales. So that would be this line item. So I'm gonna upload some files here. Again, any kind of file type is acceptable. Okay. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the months where I had um, economic harm. And if you remember on this template, so I've got these dollar amounts, what I want to do is enter them exactly as they appear. So when I click March of 2019, I'm gonna look at this document and I'm gonna say, okay, 57.65 for 2019. And then I'm gonna look at March 2020 and it was $4,500. So most people will generally have cents. Include the cents. Include the exact number as it appears on the document that you've uploaded. Do not round. Do not neglect to put the cents on. The exact number as it appears. So then I'd fill out all the corresponding months that I have. Because it's now September, you could do March to August if you've got your August numbers complete. Then when you're done entering months, you click Next. If you suffered other economic harm, you select yes. We gave you some built-in options here to pick from, things that we assumed people may have spent money on. If none of those fit you, what you spent money on, we've got five other line items. So I'm going to select, um, I'm going to select, I have a canceled event email here. So this is an event that maybe I would have gone to in October. That's beyond the revenue month. So the income from this event would not have been captured in my revenue table. That's another common thing to look out for. If you're claiming revenue loss, make sure it does not appear in your revenue table. You need to provide documentation for 
this event, for example, is saying that the sheep and wool growers of New York has decided to cancel the festival. So it's a third party cancel cancellation. So it's an eligible expense to include. So what I will do is go to other and say I lost $5,725. I would upload that email template as an example. The drop down menu, um, I've lost a uh, market or consumer segment, and I would say event canceled by organizers unable to vend as usual. So, in the description section, you want to provide us with enough information that we understand why this is pandemic related and why you otherwise cannot sell the product. If you were claiming PPE, for example, you could say, you know, $200. Um, I've got a sample invoice here for a few different line items. What we'll look for here is a specific line item cost. So this is a, a very basic, not related invoice. So one line might say gloves, one line might say masks. The next line might have nothing to do with the pandemic. It might say, you know, shampoo because you happen to go to CVS and you bought your staff some PPE. So what we want to see is those dollar amounts circled or highlighted or otherwise called out to say, OK, I spent this many dollars on the PPE for this invoice. Some folks are uploading 10 or 15 pages of invoices for one line item. And our reviewers have a really hard time finding the exact dollar amount that you're claiming when there's 10 or 15 pages of invoices. So if that's the case, say you bought um, you bought PPE supplies from Amazon and Webstaurant and CVS and you want to include it all on one line item, just make a cover sheet that lines out the specific dollar amount for each store that you're looking for. Um, and if you can circle or highlight the specific amounts. So this would be an example of an invoice that you could say it's $170, but actually only 40 plus 70 if we're using those as an example, $110 would be for PPE. So I would make sure that that matches exactly on my invoice. I'd upload my file. OK, we'd say we necessary safety and sanitation. And I bought all staff masks, gloves, thermometers. And um, face shields. So that would be an example of us saying, OK, they're saying they're buying mask gloves, all these things. Does the invoice correspond with what they're saying they're buying? And is that pandemic related? Um, clearly, most PPE at this point in time is. So once we've got all of those things done, do not uncheck a line once you've checked it and added information because that will delete it from your application. So we've added everything that we want to add. Um, if we've received any compensation that would be, be considered duplicative, so if you received a PPP or EIDL or any of the USDA FSA programs that covered your losses and you're using them for the same reasons contained in this application, you would have to select yes and enter a dollar amount. If you've not applied for any other programs, um, select no. If you applied for and received um, an Agency of Agriculture Working Lands grant earlier this year, that does not count as a duplicative payment. So you can click no for that as well. Then you're just about done with your application. Uh, this is the review screen. You just go through, make sure everything is correct. If you see that something is incorrect, you could go back um, to that section and fix it. If you want to add anything, you realize that you've forgotten to upload something that's really important, um, an invoice, or you were able to finish up your September books and you want to enter that line item in, just make sure you review the documentation and upload it as appropriate. You select next when you're happy. These are certification questions that you are legally attesting to. 
um, in your application. You just click right through once you've read them and understand. And then you attest. This is the same as um, a legal signature. So by signing your name here, you're saying that the application is full and complete to your knowledge and all of the above statements are you agree to. You submit it. And now you're done. So confirmation number, you get um, a little notification about the process of review. And when you go back to your dashboard here, you will see that it appears in your dashboard. So here's the one I just did. Application 2313, test application, submitted 914, and I can view the submission right here. If you get an incomplete notice, it will switch back and it will say incomplete, um, just like this one does, and you'll be able to edit it. And that is the process of submitting an Ag and Working Lands application.